Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 123, the last episode of the year of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Giltak, and thanks for joining me again today on the podcast. Uh, we have a ton of stuff. Again. Again, man. Uh, too much stuff to even talk about. We even left some things off the list. So it this actually may be a long episode. And uh, you know what? Maybe that's for the best because uh, this is going to be the last time you see us for a while. Anyway, before I get started, I want to talk about uh, some of the businesses in our community that help the CCFR radio podcast continue going. Vortex, the force of optics. We'd like to thank our friends over at Vortex Canada for continuing to support the podcast. You can check out all their exceptional products at vortexcanada.net. That's vortexcanada.net. And also our great friends over at the Saskatchewan Rivers chapter of Safari Club International. They do a lot of great work over there, including supporting the CCFR. So make sure you check them out at saskriversci.com. That's saskriversci.com. SCI.com. Of course, don't forget our friends over at C Toms. C Toms Academy provides life saving training in trauma care and human performance. Perfect for outdoor enthusiasts, hunters, shooters. You can check them out at ctomsinc.com. That's ctomsinc.com. And if you're in the market for firearms, ammunition, cold weather gear, you name it, you'll find it all through our friends over at North Pro Sports. You can check them out at northprosports.com. That's northprosports.com. All right, so the first thing I've got for you is a housekeeping item. Uh, The next podcast won't be in two weeks. It'll actually be in three weeks, which is January the 12th. So take some time off over Christmas and over New Year's, over the holidays. Forget about Bill C-21, right? The house is risen. There's nobody, there's no movement. Nobody's doing anything. So just take some time off and relax. Don't think about politics for at least three weeks, okay? Uh, I'd like to think that I could, I would be able to take uh, that time off too, but unfortunately, I'm going to be just as busy as always. I'll grab a day here and there or whatever, but I'll be busy, and I'll tell you why in a second. So January 12th will be the next one. Now, the next thing, if you remember, it wasn't the last podcast. It might have been the one before that or the one before that. I I think it was when things really lit up over Bill C-21, and I said, oh, listen, In the next podcast, I'm going to detail exactly what we're going to do about this bill, what the CCFR is going to do. And I didn't do that. And so what happened, and so I'm I'm going to talk to you about that now, what happened was I made up a list, like what can be done, right? Because we're limited, right? At the end of the day, we need a new government that'll just stop, you know, trying, getting into our lives and turning it upside down, right? But there are things that we can do to push back against these people to make it miserable for them to do these things to us and maybe get them to change their minds. Not easy to do, but there are things that can be done. So when I made this list, there were things that we could do that we could do right now, which we actually did, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, And then there's things that are going to take additional work that I don't want to talk about because I don't want anyone to interfere with them until we're actually rolling them out. So what we did do is we did go to um, to Ottawa. We did testify for, for the committee. We did put up with all the crap that came with that, by the way. We did a press conference. Then I went back to Ottawa. We met with politicians and with a senator, and we also did another press conference. So we did two press conferences on Parliament Hill. That second one was quite well attended and actually had an impact. So that was, that was interesting. We also, during this time between then and now, produced over 40 videos worth of co- online content, which we spread across all of our platforms. So YouTube, Facebook, and Rumble, and then pieces of it everywhere else. And then we used our platform because... Remember, we, we actually, as an organization and our supporters, dominate the federal government of Canada on social media. Like, that's, that's how active we are as a group on social media. It's pretty, pretty wild. So much so that they, they, you know, planned and executed an offensive against us to try to destroy us, if you remember, just a few weeks ago. So, and more, there's been new developments on that I'm going to share with you, too. So, anyway, um, so we did... All of that, and obviously all that um, activity is waking people up, 
and it contributed to the su success of our letter writing campaign. If you remember, bury their desks in mail, I think, or in letters, I think it was called. So we did the press conferences. We did a lobbying trip to Ottawa. We talked to the Senate. We did all this social media stuff and we did our letter writing campa campaign all in the last couple of months. And that's, that's not included in the plan I'm gonna roll out for you. There's a whole bunch of new stuff that I couldn't talk about that will roll out on January the 26th. So on January 26th, there'll be another podcast and I will reveal the rest of it to you. So, um, and all that work has to be done and it rolled out when we talk about it so that it can't be undermined, if that makes sense. So I have five and a half weeks roughly uh, for me and the rest of the team. It's all hands on deck at the CCFR right now. So everyone will be working on this to get it all done or at least if a few things are, are straggling over the 26th, that's okay because we want all that done on or about the 26th because Parliament comes back on January the 30th. So we want them to come back to, oh man, the CCFR didn't get intimidated by what we did to them. In fact, they worked even harder and more determined than ever. They're relentless! So that's, that's the plan. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. So I, I didn't mention it any earlier because I couldn't. We were extremely busy, as you well know as well. I just didn't have time to, to do that. And then all the items that I couldn't talk about, you'll know on January the 26th on the CCFR radio podcast and uh, through our um, email blast and, and all the rest of that stuff. So that's what's going, going on. Um, now, I've had to do a couple of takes because there was a lot in my head I wanted to get out, but I don't know if I mentioned all the videos that we've done in the last two months actually have resulted in two, around 2 million views, which is tremendous for Canada, 2 million views. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people are awake and also the wildlife federations as well, so that there was such a response in our letter, letter writing campaign and everyone else's, right? And we're not, not gonna take credit for the stuff that other people do. So their light, letter writing campaigns as well. But I think our material is reaching a, a lot larger audience and people are waking up and they're playing an active role in trying to push back against this stuff and it's working. So anyway. So that's what we did in the last two months. And you'll see what we're going to do in the next five weeks on January the 26th. All right. Next thing. Speaking of a coordinated attack campaign against a, an organization that doesn't seem to let up ever. Um, <laughs> uh, there's been a bit of a development. So there, I've, had to, I've had to think a lot uh, um, about what went on with the big controversy that the CCFR was embroiled in. And I got a lot of um, opinions from other people and read a lot of opinions. And, you know, in society, I think you should be an honest person, um, a good faith uh, player or broker, for sure. Um, and you can have a difference of opinion, but I don't think that it's okay to lie. And not only is it not okay to lie just to benefit yourself, but I don't think it's, it's even worse. It's more of an offense in my mind to lie to hurt someone else. So I'm faced with a choice on whether, you know, I, I have to, and when I say I, don't, don't get me wrong, I mean the CCFR as an organization, including everyone that supports us, because it's that group of people that enable us to, to wield the big stick that we do in situations like this. I have to make a decision on whether or not we need to play the role of a parent to all of these different people that, that don't know that you shouldn't do those things, that those things are not only bad for them, for their own self-esteem, if they, if they possess any, but also for society at large. Because when you, when you lie about things and then you lie about other people to hurt them, that in, in our connected society, when you have a big group of people either living in the same area or connected digitally, that can have a lot of really bad consequences you know, in a variety of different things, right? And I don't think I need to explain all this stuff to, to, you know, you guys, but it's just like, I have to think about that. Are we the people that have to hold them accountable? So we started to do some of that work. And I think you're going to see us do a little bit more of that work on the side as well. We've been very busy. <laughs> you know, we haven't, nobody's taken any time off at all, I assure you, in the last few months, that's for sure. Um, so let me, let me read this for you. 
So this was printed in the Montreal Gazette. They wrote a story um, during that controversy, and they published this on December the 18th. Uh, just a few days ago from when you're watching this. So the article says, uh, it's entitled Retraction and Apology. So it says, on December 6, 2022, the newspaper published a column critical of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights for using the term poly as a promotional code for the sale of clothing and other items. The CCFR has advised the newspaper that the use of poly as a promotional code was not meant to reference the mass shooting at a cold polytechnic, but was instead a reference to the Twitter account at Poly Saint-Souvien, it says, has been critical of it. It's not a claim. If you looked into it, you would know that. But before you print stuff, you should probably make sure it's not a lie. Anyway, the newspaper retracts statements in the column indicating um, that the CCFR's use of the promotional code was meant to refer directly to the shootings uh, or was meant to make fun of the shootings and apologizes for these statements. So um, I'm not sure that this particular thing is over yet. But that's what we've gotten so far. So, you know, when you when you do wrong things, it's important to acknowledge that. So, I, yeah, I'm uh, as you can see, I'm kind of struggling about what to say and not to say. But you're probably going to see a little bit more of this, and you may see different things than just published retractions and apologies. Anyway. I think that's about all I can say about that. But yeah, so again, there's a big difference between what people claim we did and what we actually did. And that difference is really important. And the fact that I even had to go get that is tells you that there's something really wrong in our country, really wrong, because that was a full-on, fully coordinated, and coordinated by the government of Canada. I think that might be lost on a few people out there, like coordinated by the government at the same time, like fully coordinated, and the mainstream media, none of these none of these outlets even took a second to look to see if that was true before they printed it. So, I don't know. I maybe I'm too too. Um, what's it? Maybe I'm naive. Maybe I don't understand uh, the real way to operate in this world. But it's not like that. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Anyway, let's continue on. All right, a um, couple things I want to say about this. I, I don't know if I'm getting his name right, this Francesco Villi or whatever his name was. This guy that shot a bunch of his neighbors in their uh, in his apartment building or condo or whatever it was. There, there inevitably will be people running around saying, look, a licensed gun owner. And so I just got some thoughts. I may or may not know any of this stuff uh, specifically for a fact, but let me just kind of throw out some possibilities, let's say, for you, okay? It's very possible that this guy at his age was a licensed gun owner. Not a lot of 71 or 73 year old guys, however old he was, are out there buying illegal handguns off the street. Possible, but probably not. So he's probably a licensed gun owner with a valid license. Probably uh, had a handgun that was registered, legally owned, that he responsibly owned for God knows how long right? But he was suffering from men mental illness. There's the possible, and, and if you look at his videos, his online videos, and you see some of the quotes, he, s he was seriously mentally ill. He was going through some kind of crisis. He thought the electricity was killing him. Uh, he thought that everyone was trying to kill him. He had all kinds of stuff. Um, he had been in legal battles, and he may or may not have had restraining orders on him. And if that's true, then this looks a lot different than you think it does. I had people uh, sending me um, messages like, oh my God, I hope this guy wasn't a licensed gun owner. I'm like, yeah, I probably was. You know, because everybody, there, there's all kinds of people can go crazy once in a while. There's people that go crazy with a valid driver's license and drive over a whole bunch of people in a downtown center, right? There are people that set nightclubs on fire and kill 35 people and injure over 100, right? These things happen when people go nuts. But when it comes to firearms, it's actually different because there's a system in place. There's a system of red flags that have, has been in place since the early 90s, right? There's a CFO whose responsibility it is that if someone has restraining orders for potential violence, people saying, I think this guy's violent, I need him to stay away from me. He could crack at any time. And they're like, huh, well, and there's a system, right? 
continuous eligibility screening where a flag pops up. If I don't, if I'm the CFO and I don't do anything about that, when if if ever there was a reason to go take somebody's guns away, it would have been this and other situations in Canada's past. If you look at almost every single situation where a licensed gun owner did something wrong, it's almost never, and I mean literally almost never, that there were no warning signs. Time after time, we see stuff like this. It's like, oh yeah, the cops didn't do nothing. Oh, the CFO didn't do nothing. So what's the answer? Oh, obviously we need to ban guns or we need more law. But did you use the law? Did you, did you go have his guns taken? Did you cancel his PAL? He had a registered firearm, assumingly. Did you do any of that stuff? Well, no. Well, obviously we need more laws so that you what can't do those and justify more laws based on your in, your inability or or reluctance uh, or unwillingness to exercise the laws that you already have. I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. I could you know I could tell you a handful of situations where somebody had a had a criminal record for serious serious offenses like violent offenses. You know, there's some people circulating around who are familiar with a licensed gun owner that got a license when it had kidnapping charges, you know, that had happened a, a couple of years before. Like, the, I agree some people shouldn't have access to legal firearms, for sure. And this is one of those situations where the system just sat back and watched this happen. So anyway, but apparently you can use this as an excuse for more laws, more laws that you're not going to act on, Actually, let's just go straight, like the liberals are doing, straight to the nuclear option. Oh, we'll just have to ban all legal guns. Criminals, we're not going to do much about that. We're going to let them do their thing. But no one can actually responsibly own a firearm. I don't know. Anyway, I think there's a, a lot more to think about when it comes to this situation and many others that were like it. And again, at the end of the day, uh, just a handful of them in the history of Canada. But anyway, it's, anyway think long and hard about this. And, you know, and it's very similar to the opinion that I have on the Canadian firearms program and the licensing and the vetting system where they're like, okay, well, your spouse has to sign off on this, number one. And number two, you need two references. And then they call no one. They're like, eh, you know, we'll just call 10% of them. You know, a little batch testing. Who knows? You know, we're going to break a few eggs making this omelet. But, hey, no big deal. That's just what we're going to do. We don't have any money to call any references but we got literally billions to confiscate firearms. I don't know. I don't know. Trying to be reasonable. That's how, you know, that all just seems like a reasonable uh, string of thoughts to me. So anyway. All right. Last thing I want to cover with you is <laughs> what we see now is kind of interesting is we see what we call an evolving narrative happening in Canada. This is, this is interesting. I have some, I have some clips for you. So if you remember back before um, the May 2020 gun ban, the government was only worried about assault weapons. They want to get, get assault weapons out of Canada. And then it was like, there's this big fight. It's like, there aren't any assault weapons in Canada. They were banned in 1977. Okay, fine, we're gonna change the language. Assault style weapons. They kind of look like assault weapons, but they aren't assault weapons. Those are too dangerous to, be, to have on our streets. Now remember, like I'm sure all of you were out on the street earlier today, didn't see any assault weapons on there. And there's, you know, and when it comes to AR-15s and stuff, it's like, oh, it's just the AR-15, right? It's a military assault weapon. Oh yeah, assault style. So May 2020 gun ban happens. This is that and rocket launchers, these assault style rocket launchers. We've got to get rid of those. And then there was the government started lying, right? So they're like, oh, we didn't ban any 22s. That's misinformation, that's disinformation, that's the lies of the conservatives and of the gun lobby. Well, it turns out they did. And I'll give you an example, the Mossberg uh, 715T. 22, you know, I'm sorry if you got a Mossberg, but they're, they're a junky little, I think it's a 702 Plinkster in a body kit. And of course, previous to that, like the Blaze 47, right? The Mossberg Blaze, again, a 22 caliber rifle in a little body kit that looks like a, like a cartoon AK-47, almost looks like a toy. Too dangerous. It's an assault weapon. Weapons of war, remember? They said it's only weapons of war used in a battlefield, like the Mossberg 22, the 7, 715T, obviously used by a lot of militaries around the world. 22 caliber, clunky magazine, jams constantly. You could break it over your knee. Definitely weapon of war. And of course, they said, oh, we didn't ban any hunting 
firearms. Well, of course they did. They banned a, a, a whole selection of bolt action rifles and they banned some shotguns because they sort of looked like assault style <laughs> weapons, right? So fine, we're used to these lies, right? And they lie constantly. But if you remember, the narrative there was nothing we're doing will have any effect on the legitimate uh, activities of sports shooting and hunting. Sports shooting and hunting, recreational shooting. No, we're not doing anything to stop that. And then they were like, well, even if you own some of these, we're gonna pay you for them and you can replace it with something else that's not banned. But then they started banning them via um, variant status, right? So, right, it happened to me with the BCL Coyote that I bought to replace my AR-15 so I could still continue to do what I do. And of course it was prohibited while it was in the mail to me, while it was being shipped to me. So ha ha ha, jokes on me, I guess, you know, but hey, I deserve it. So then comes along Bill C-21 and they're like, oh, well, we have to enshrine all this stuff in legislation and we got to get rid of the toys. The toys are the problem. It's things that l even look like assault style weapons. Assault style weapon lookalikes, right? So ban airsoft. And we're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, so there's a pushback against that. I'm like, oh, I don't know. It's not all airsoft, whatever. And that's gone on. Then it was handguns. And it's like, well, now you've taken the semi-autos and you've taken the handguns, but nothing you're doing. And then they stopped talking about sports shooters. They just stopped saying it, right? It's the evolving narrative. Now it's like, oh, they, you know, you're not losing anything. It's not a ban. It's a freeze, right? It's a freeze. And then now the rest of the semi-autos. So now there is no semi-automatic sports shooting or recreational firearms at all or hunting guns either, right? And no handguns. Sports shooting, done. You can use a handgun or a bolt action or lever action now, basically, or maybe a pump action shotgun if those aren't banned in the coming months. So, and then they, so they drop that and it's like, it is an absolute lie. We are not banning hunting firearms, firearms appropriate for hunting. Total lie, misinformation, it's the conservative party and their friends in the gun lobby, people like me. Evil people like me are lying to you. Don't listen to them, they're liars. Listen to us. We're not banning, banning any hunting firearms. Anyway, check this clip out. Bill C-21 doesn't target law-abiding gun owners, it targets handgun violence. We heard the Prime Minister today saying you're not going after uh, hunting rifles and shotguns. He did. Then why are there hunting rifles and shotguns on your new list? Well, I'm going to get to the how we're tackling the problem around gun violence and specifically AR-15 style guns. Uh, but first, I want... Mr. Speaker, uh, my honorable colleague from the Conservative Party can continue to spread disinformation, but I will tell you very clearly that on this side of the House, we are targeting those AR-15 style guns which have been used. We are not going after guns that are commonly used for hunting. We are after the guns that exert uh, the most lethal force in the shortest period of time. And it continues to be uh, a concern of mine that the Conservatives are sowing fear among law-abiding gun owners. And you see now the consequences of that. Where My point to you is, is that we need to have a thoughtful debate, a principled debate, a debate that is based on the facts, and we are not getting the straight facts no. from the Conservative Party of Canada. Okay. okay, now what you're seeing is you're seeing the government, and you, I mean, if you've been paying attention, you've seen this going on for a long time, since Bill C-21, well, since May 2020, but since Bill C-21 was, was introduced, right? The narrative is like, this has got nothing to do with hunters. First, it was hunters and sports shooters, but it's like, okay, fine. We're banning all sports shooting firearms. Okay, so they did that. And now they, they've stopped even talking about sports shooting. So, of course, they lied before. Now they, now they went on to, oh, we're never going to touch the hunters because you guys, if you're a hunter, that's an even bigger, far bigger community than sports shooters, right? We've talked about this a million times. So what they do is they set this narrative. Anyone who says that there's hunting firearms going to be affected by this bill, they're lying to you, right? When in fact, it's the liberals that are lying to you. So they, but they keep reinforcing it because most people will get exhausted and they will be like, you know what? I'm just going to trust the government. They're, they have to tell me the truth, I think, anyway, and I'll just leave it there. Well, we know that they're lying. Why? Because we're clairvoyant? No, because we read the bill and we know how this stuff works. So not only are there uh, a tremendous amount of hunting and uh, hunting rifles and shotguns included in the bill, but also the language of variants, meaning that anything that's a variant of a bolt action rifle that they've prohibited or a lever action rifle or a semi-auto shotgun or whatever, 
That can be banned by regulation, not legislation. That can be banned under the cover of darkness at any time in the future by a minority government. So anyway, their narrative starts to crumble. And the, one of the reasons is, is that the government's expert flat out said in committee, in C21 committee, and Bob Zimmer, I'm going to show you the clip of Bob Zimmer. He says flat out like, yeah, your expert said that they are hunting firearms that are banned. And then the next clip, check it out, is now they have to evolve their narrative. So it went from absolutely not everyone's lying to you to, okay, there are hunting firearms. There are hunting rifles and shotguns, but you know some of them are just too powerful. You're just going to have to get them confiscated and buy new ones to keep us happy. Mr. Speaker, when I asked the Liberal firearms expert Murray Smith at committee if hunting rifles would be banned as a result of Bill C-21, he answered, yes. What are you guys doing? A year of challenges and divisive issues that remain unresolved, including the controversial Liberal government's gun ban, with Justin Trudeau admitting that some of those rifles, even those used legally by hunters, will be banned. There are some guns, yes, that we're going to have to take away from people who were using them to hunt and say, but we're going to also make sure that you're able to buy other guns from a long list of, of guns that are, except that are fine for hunting. Well, there it is. Now ah, we were lying before and we were lying about everybody else lying. It was us the whole time. We are banning some hunting guns, but you know what? They're just too powerful for you. So a couple of things. Number one, look at Trudeau's face. He looks like a kid that got caught shoplifting. Okay, he looks like a kid with 30 CDs in his jacket and somebody just grabbed his arm. Look at him. Okay, but do you think for a second that he cares? And another thing, it's like, He's like, okay, fine. These guns are too powerful, powerful for you. So here's what we want you to do in the interim. We're going to confiscate these guns eventually when this bill passes. Okay, we're going to confiscate them. And we may or may not pay you for them, depending on how we feel. See if we can get away with it, if, you know, depending on where, which way the political wind is blowing. But anyway, that's a separate thing. In the interim, here's what you can do, commoner. You can go take your after-tax money, your little whatever we, we let you keep, and you can go buy some other guns on your best guess on whether or not we're going to ban that either because it's a variant of one we already banned or we may ban it by, by name or we may move to our new narrative, which is if, you, if you've been paying attention, you've heard Marco Mendicino say this like literally dozens of times. And I could find the clips, um, but it would take me too long and put them together. But this is his new, his new tagline. We need to get these weapons out of our communities and put an end and be finished with gun violence once and for all. Put an end to gun violence once and for all. Stop gun violence once and for all. It's very final language, and the reason they're saying that is, is that when they do all these things and violence continues, they'll be like, we just, we need to stop, stop this. This has to be dealt with once and for all. And they're, gonna, they're just going to take the rest from you. Right? That's, that's how it works. Let's see where this is going. They've lied at every single stop along the way. And then they just and they just just walk it off like nothing. They just like Pfft, what? I didn't lie. These are the liars. Yeah, but it's right here in the bill. Yeah, it's not. No, yeah, no, it's not. I don't see it. It's like well, it's right here. I don't see it. You're probably a liar. And you know what? And the last thing I'll say about this because it is infuriating. And you know, and believe me, none of this is lost on me. I deal with this crap every day. I deal with these these people every day. Imagine that you knew an actual real person in your life that acted like this, that lied to you and lied about everyone else around them. Everyone else that you had a relationship with, they just lied about them to, to smear them while they were the ones that were actually lying to you. Can you imagine if you actually knew a person in your personal life like this? Like, what would you do with them? Like, you should be like, I never want to see you ever again. But imagine that person has the power of the federal government behind them, and they're reaching into your life on a daily basis. Now, I'm not trying to get you enraged. I think what I'm trying to do is just like, I think, I think we get desensitized to how monstrous all of this, be, how just filthy this behavior really is. Whether it's using the, the mechanisms of government, the resources of government and the mainstream media to run a really serious smear campaign on somebody or an organization. And it's not the first time that's happened either, by the way or even just to, to justify confiscating property from millions of Canadians. I haven't done, man, I haven't done nothing. 
nothing, right? Really important property, right? Because I think people also that don't own guns don't understand how what unique property firearms are. Firearms have a wide variety of uses and are extremely important to the people that own them. So anyway, pretty wild. So that's your evolving narrative right there, right in front of your eyes. Anyway, so that can be very angering. It's, I, I hate the fact that I even have to bring this stuff up, but it's important for you to understand what's going on if you don't already. It's important for other people to understand what's going on so that they can do something to stop it. So it's getting really close to the holidays. I'm gonna put the stuff behind me and just do my regular work because I know it has to be done and I don't have to be emotionally attached to it. So let's be outraged for one or two minutes Put that in, compartmentalize it in the back of your brain, like I will deal with this later on January the 26th, right? Because use it to motivate yourself. Use it to make yourself determined so that you will write those letters. You will talk to your MP. You will show up on, on election day with everybody you know and drive them in your vehicle to the polls and drive them home after and get these people out of power as far away from power as we possibly can get them. That's what this outrage what you need it to you need it to drive you not to wreck your life because you're giving them something you're giving up something to them just to to make you determined and motivated to make sure that these people aren't able to do this if there's a spring election the ccfr will be ready and we need you to participate and we will make it easy for you we will tell you everything that you need to do to throw these people from power okay that's our job so anyway all right, via Skype, we've got Tracy Wilson of the CCFR. Wilson! Wilson! <laughs> Giltaka! So How you, are you? Good, good. Yeah, do you have anything Christmassy on, as if I don't know? Yes, so I've got my little snowflake earrings on, and I'm not sure if that's because I'm feeling festive or I'm trolling my detractors, but here we are. All right, well, <laughs> I don't have my snowflake earrings on. Uh, I left them at home. I'll send you some. Okay, well, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. <laughs> All right, so we have so much stuff to talk about. It's ridiculous. I say that every every podcast, and I'll, I'll I'll mention this too, kind of while we're on the on the topic. I think in the last I don't know five podcasts, usually when I come in and sort of do the monologue in the beginning or my part, I mention it's like we got so much to talk about, and I I hearken back to I don't know what it was like I don't know four four months ago, five maybe six months ago or something, and it was like I was struggling to come up with things to talk about or yeah. things would be too short, especially with the TV show. I remember it was like, Oh, you know, what am I really? Gonna... And now it's, there's too much stuff to even like, we're leaving things out. Yeah. We have to cut the list. Yeah, every, yeah. every episode anyway. Yeah. All right. We're going to focus on, uh, on what we got on this list. Like literally that's how much stuff I'm just showing this to the camera. There we go. Just showing this. It's a full list. All right, let's get started. Um, Bill uh, C21, the liberals uh, juggernaut, uh, super <laughs> successful Bill C-21. Uh, give us a little bit of an update. The House has risen. So, Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it gives us a little bit of breathing room, but by all means, we cannot take our foot off the gas. So the House has risen uh, for the winter break. All the MPs go back to their constituents and go home for the Christmas break, and they will be back. The House will resume sitting on January 30th. So I know I've seen a lot of people thinking, well, what does this mean? Is the bill delayed until April or whatever? We don't really know yet, but the House will resume, which means committee will resume in February. So, yeah, it's not over, but you've got a little bit of a break and lots of time to write your letters. Yeah, so they'll be back on January the 30th and then it mm -hmm. continues on where it left off as far as C-21 committee. Yeah, and of course, that was nuts. I don't know if anybody listening to this saw that last meeting. It is on our, on our YouTube channel, which is good because it's mysteriously disappeared off the SECU site. But um, in any event, that was a wild meeting. And of course, um, the NDP and the, or the Liberals and the Bloc had sort of filibustered the last two meetings and the Conservatives and the NDP hadn't had a chance to speak to it. And, of course, they come into this meeting and we start off with just a total, <laughs> a total slaughter of this bill. Um, Christina Michaud, the block critic for public safety, introduced a motion 
for the committee to vote on to, of course, do some more consultations. She thought, you know, let's do another two meetings. We didn't get to consult with Indigenous or Northern communities or even hunters for that matter um, on, of course, Amendment G4 and G46 that basically bans pretty much everything semi-auto along with a variety of other guns. So the Conservatives came back. Raquel Doncho sort of countered with um, a suggestion that they have 20 meetings to properly consult because, of course, not only do they now need to consult a whole variety of new people, everybody who's already testified to the to the bill, to C-21, didn't get to speak to this massive sweeping gun ban. So it's a bit of a mess. And she also suggested that the committee travel to northern remote Indigenous and Inuit communities to speak to people there who maybe, you know, number one, don't have the ability or the opportunity to travel and also may not have adequate internet to join in virtually. So the committee sort of, you know, going back and forth on this, they seem to have settled on eight meetings. The Liberals haven't had a chance to speak to it yet. Um, But that's basically where the meeting hung. They got hung up on a decision to have eight more consultations, some travel to the northern and remote communities. And that's sort of where it sat until <laughs> Pam Damoff, liberal MP, put forward um, a motion to adjourn the meeting. And interestingly enough, Raquel was like, what happens when you adjourn? What happens to the original motion for consultation that's on the table? And basically, the chair said it would die. So it's just an interesting way to handle, you know, nothing says reconciliation, like trying to close debate on how many consultations should be done with the Indigenous community, if any. So I don't know. It was, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah. So luckily, um, as you mentioned, we we do have that meeting on the YouTube channel uh, because yeah. I went to go pull a couple of clips out of it today and it's it's not there. So I don't know mm-hmm. what's going on there, but anyway, and there's a bunch of meetings missing from the past uh, for C21 uh, as well. But anyway, we skipped ahead in, in the list a little bit. Um, so now I'm now I don't know what to do. Uh, but yeah, oh. the Assembly of First Nations also condemned Bill C21. So yeah, yeah. actually, National Chief Roseanne Archibald um, they had an emergency meeting here in Ottawa and held a press conference, and they condemned C21. Um, It appears that it also may interfere with UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And of course, anything that may possibly affect Indigenous people, there's an obligation for the government to consult them. It's not really optional. So, yeah, there's there's a huge mess with this bill and the included amendments, and it's not going so well. No, it's not. Um, so it's 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 just kind of interesting, right? The liberals themselves are the one trying to silence indigenous voices, and yeah. especially Pam Damoff. She, I mean, she she made the she made the motion to adjourn specifically yeah. because uh, she she clear she's been on these committees forever. She knows exactly how it works. But yes, uh, yeah, she does. slippery stuff, man. Um, but you know, the the liberals are probably happy about all this stuff because mm-hmm. they they tried to sneak in these amendments. They tried to. They're trying to basically take everything but a handful of hunting rifles and shotguns left in the country. Um, yeah, they've been caught. They have an opportunity to kind of reel it back, so they can they can be seen like, oh, listen, we're really listening. Maybe we got it wrong or whatever. They always pretend that they're innocent, right? Oh, we just you know we want to get this right, so now we're going to talk to you. Um, and the other thing too is if this ends up getting, if uh, Parliament is prorogued, uh, prorogued, I should say when it, when uh, when they come back. Uh, or there's an election, um, what they can yeah. do is they can say, listen, C-21 just didn't work out because of all this obstructionism from all the other parties. Uh, but you know what? We promise that if you elect us in this new election, we'll get it done for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They they continuously use the same thing over and over again. Gun control is a repetitive election promise from yeah. this government. So. Yeah, I th- I think that's it. So you know they can also they can walk some of it back if it's not so popular. So yeah, they're in a weird um, they're in a, a favorable position either way. Yeah, it's heads I win, tails you lose with these people. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, the fireworks still continue. Um, <laughs> yeah. If you remember, uh, Alistair McGregor uh, did you know performed a speech in the last um, in the last meeting. I I looked for the clip, but it was only on our YouTube channel. Anyway, I'm not going to show the clip. 
Um, but he he really he really <laughs> chastised the liberals, which is unusual because they're usually in lockstep. The NDP are, and and including Alistair McGregor is in lockstep with the liberals, no matter what they do. Uh, so this was a bit of a departure. I I think he smells blood in the water. He's like, I'm not going down with the liberals. I need to save my career. Um, yeah. But anyway, under the under the guise, and I said it before. I was like, oh, I'm listening to my constituents. Like, well, you you weren't listening to them when they were take, having all of their semi autos taken. Basically, their sporting rifles, right. and and then you we're, weren't listening to them when they're you know the handguns. And if you remember in the last episode, I was like, here's a here's a clip of him. Come on, Mr. Giltak. Come on, man. You know, like they're not You've taking got our, other guns. Yeah, how you Come got on. other guns you can mess around with? And it's like, oh yeah. And I'm like, and then I'm they run- those too. well, yeah. And I'm I'm running out of guns, and it's like, and everybody's like, run out of guns. <laughs> so anyway, he's he's going on and on about um, how bad the liberals have acted and how this is a, an abusive process. And he he mentioned one interesting thing that the liberals have brought forward forty six amendments to their own bill. Yeah. Like, if you think about that, this the liberal government tabled this legislation. It's their bill. How on earth do you table legislation and then table an additional 46 amendments to that legislation? You know, normally you put forward a bill, you know, you have some debate in the House and then you have some testimony in committee. You kind of go back and forth and you use amendments to sort of fine tune, you know, little elements, small changes that that can make a little bit of difference. Right. Forty six amendments to your own legislation said tells all Canadians they didn't put. They didn't they didn't craft this properly to begin with. So, yeah, this bill definitely needs to go in the garbage. It's junk. Yeah. Something was going on with this bill. It yeah. was like, you know what? Let's go all the way. Kind of halfway in the middle. They were just like, oh, OK, forget it. We're going to take them all. Yeah. You know, and we're going to give it a yeah. try. So I don't know. Pretty crazy. You know what? Let's let's <laughs> do something funny instead. So we have a little clip. Of uh, <laughs> of Talib Noor Mohammed, oh, yeah. so <laughs> of all good. ridiculous people, like just a, a parody oh. of a person. Um, so uh. he tells a story. I'm going to show both clips, okay? And you haven't. Okay. I don't think you saw the other one, or maybe you may remember it. But he gets he gets on the, on the uh, C21 committee, and he's like, you know, I asked a friend of mine, a friend of mine that's a hunter. Like, you, you know, this guy lives in probably. I know a guy. Yeah, I know a guy that's a hunter. And if you and if you shoot a um, a deer with a firearm that has, you know, 10,000 joules of energy at the muzzle, because that's what they're talking about, the legislation, you know, you strike a deer with that and the, you know, there'll be nothing left of the deer. Okay. So (laughs) this is the, and these, you know, these people are so ridiculous. They're like, literally like clowns. Like I, you know, it's almost like if you close your eyes, you can see some guy with makeup and a red wig on, right? Just a, just a, just an absolute clown. So he's like, there's going to be nothing left of the deer. So then what he does, he doubles down as clowns do. And he asked Murray Smith. Now, say what you want about Murray Smith. He has a lot of knowledge. His motives are, are beyond questionable. But, he, you know, he's been doing this stuff for a long time. And he, and he knows stuff. He is an expert. So he asked Murray mm-hmm. Smith, what would happen if you shot a, uh, a deer using 10,000 joules? I guess that's the proper terminology for a larger rifle. So this could be a right. 460 or even, at worst case scenario, a, a 50 cal or whatever. Uh, right. Anyway. So first, first, first clip is Talib yapping about all his friends that are hunters and what they've told him, and then the expert, and he's hoping that he'll he'll confirm. It'll just like just be pieces everywhere. Anyway, check it out. I decided I would speak to one of my friends who is a hunter, and I asked, "What would happen if you were to hunt a moose or a deer uh, using?" Uh, this, which is effectively a long-range sniper rifle, and if you were to take a shot at a deer or a moose, what would actually happen to that deer or a moose if you were to use something that generated 10,000 joules of muzzle energy? And the response was there wouldn't be very much deer or moose left. So I, I failed to see why that would be need- needed for hunters, uh, you know, for the purpose of hunting, other than if one wanted to want to obliterate an animal. But it- so let's say I were to use. Um, Let's say I were to fire, uh, you know, I were to fire with 10,000 joules at 200 meters and I were to hit a deer. What would happen to that deer? If I were to hit it, I mean, I'm probably a terrible shot, but let's assume I were to hit. What would happen to that deer at 200 meters using 10,000 joules? Well, there, there's, a, there's a variety of factors that feed into that. One is it depends on where exactly you hit the deer. Um, uh, assuming the bullet goes through the vital organs, then... 
it's very likely the deer would be killed. Uh, there, there could be some destruction of the game meat, but that would be very dependent on the, the construction of the bullet. Uh, some bullets are, are built very solidly because they're intended for um, penetrating deep into large animals like elephants. And so on a, on a deer, the bullet would, would, pass, would probably pass through the deer um, uh, not causing much more damage than you would expect from an ordinary hunting caliber, simply because of the construction of the bullet. All right, well, there, there you have it. Um, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, I've got, um, this is the home run, watch this. And he's like, oh, I'll pass through. And, you know, I did a little bit of research because I never owned, and I'm going to go to the extreme, right? I never owned a 50 cal. And I'm like, do they make controlled expansion rounds for 50 cals? And I, I did a little bit of work because if it was a full metal jacket bullet, yeah, it would pass right through because mm -hmm. a 50 cal probably, and I'm no ballistic expert, probably wouldn't tumble. So depending on where you strike it too, if there's a, uh, you strike a, a deer where there's a lot of fluid, um, like in an organ or whatever, yeah, that there's going to be hydrostatic shock and there could be a problem or whatever, but, uh, you know, with the amount of meat left, but nonetheless, that's not typically what people shoot deer with in Canada. They use those rifles for sport shooting. Uh, but anyway, right. yeah, apparently they don't, people don't use controlled expansion bullets because there's so much pressure on a 50 cal bullet that the bullet may come apart in the barrel or whatever. Uh, or even in the air. Well, speaking of shooting deer with a 50 cal, there was actually a really neat video I saw online. And it was a famous hunter from the States, Keith Warren. And he took a deer, just a regular sized white tailed deer with a 50 cal shooting at some distance. And yeah, it, it you know, did a neck shot and it was perfect. Not an ounce of meat wasted. Yeah, like... I think Talib was looking for that, you know, that story about it's nothing but fine pink mist. Like there'll be nothing left. It just obliterates it. And it's simply not true. And it was hilarious to watch him struggle with not getting that answer he wanted from Murray Smith. So, yeah, super funny. Yeah. Just a bunch of just a, a, a crowd of ridiculous people saying ridiculous things. Um, all right. <laughs> so uh, Alberta, again, stepped up again for gun owners. Yeah, so this is pretty wild. Like Alberta's just stepping up and up and up. So they've um, uh, Tyler Shandro, who's the Minister of Justice and Attorney General for Alberta with the UCP, um, has issued a protocol. Now it's not necessarily a law. It's a it's difficult to sort of dance around because he's issued a protocol to uh, the provincial courts, not to to not. Um, follow through with charges related to guns being owned and not um, not surrendered in any confiscation program coming up for guns that were banned from the May 2020 gun ban forward, including anything from C21. So basically what that boils down to is he's saying, you know what, we're not going to tie up our courts with a whole bunch of charges on legal gun owners whose only fault is owning guns they've owned forever that suddenly the liberals decide they can't have. And we're going to donate or dedicate our resources to fighting actual crime, right? Um, there's, you know, there's some back and forth. Ian Runkle did a video on this. He's a, a well-known Canadian firearms lawyer. And he said that, you know, it's almost treading on a little bit of political interference stuff because you can't really direct the courts on what to, you know, what to follow through with and what not. But I guess they can issue this protocol. So, yeah, gun owners in Alberta definitely have a friend in their provincial government for sure. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's. I think the, I think it's important that you see the intention, and I think yes. it's important that uh, that Ottawa sees the intention too. We're a province, we you know we work for our people, and we're not going to be pushed around, and so all options are on the table. Yeah, well, they said they would stand up for Albertans, and they are. So yeah. I think. More than anything, um, just that message that it sends to Ottawa that says, you know, uh, uh not here. I think that's um, that's pretty strong. You know, of course, being uh, being backed up with all, everyone else objecting to this bill as well. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's an important. Very good. It, yeah, it's important. And it's funny because you you have everybody running. You know, and I say everybody like the left or whatever, right? If you want to call them that, right? But they're running around with their hair on fire. Like, how dare they defy the perfect? <laughs> Provinces do this all the time, and so does Quebec. Yeah. Quebec has done a lot worse right. things than this, you know, and they have their own firearm laws. They have all kinds of things going. You know, it's just like, but but it's Alberta, 
So it's got to be terrible. Wow. And yeah, it's guns, it's you know, it's, it's st standing up for people that are so law abiding that they can maintain a PAL in Canada. And it's like, well, yes, don't, don't beat up on these people. And they're like, oh my God, the insolence. So anyway, so. <laughs> how, how dare you stop us from beating up these law abiding well, yeah, people? Yeah, it's such a, it, you know. How anyway, dare you? It's interesting. Um, you know, speaking of clowns. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Goody, is it Goody? 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 Yeah, Goody Hutchins. Goody Hutchins. Yeah. Uh, this liberal MP from uh, Eastern Canada. And, yeah, she's uh, from out east. Yeah, talking about her 22 gauge uh, shotgun, I guess, uh, that she uses yeah, for hunting. She got it with her FAC. She got it with her FAC. She may want to check the expiry date on that um, mm. so that she's not in unlawful possession of all these 22 gauges that she has. Uh, but anyway, just check out the clip. Because I have a shotgun and rifle that I use for, and 22 gauge that I use for ptarmigan, moose, and black bear. Uh, they're traditional guns that I've had, um, some from my father all my life, and I know many hunters that have the exact, it's like I said to you before, if, if you have a brake action, pump, lever, bolt, uh, those guns aren't on the list, and that's what 99% of hunters actually use. Thank you. Very Very oh yeah. So why wouldn't why wouldn't you take firearm advice from somebody like this? Why wouldn't you have the utmost confidence in their ability to, you know, determine what's best for Canadians? Did you see Marco? Like he almost had to get out, you know, the hook to pull the uh, the dancing clown off the stage. You know, yeah. like I I was waiting for him just to pull it out and just be like, Shh, cut, stop. Well, and and you know what? He would know because he he jams his foot in his mouth so often. He's like, oh, not you too. <laughs> You know, anyway. <laughs> it's all of us. We're all infected. Oh, my God. These people. Yeah. These, just crazy. These people. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Let's talk about some good news. And then we'll uh, we'll also say Merry Christmas to everybody and, and uh, cut it off there. So, um, I, I mean, how do you even introduce this? I can't thank our community enough for, for recognizing... Um, how hard the CCFR works and for supporting the CCFR the way that they do. And, you know, as you know, you and I, I mean, the last three weeks has been insane just yeah. you know, for, a, for a variety of different reasons. Um, but uh, but the, the support that we get from the community, which is their, the recognition for what we're doing, is just what, what an incredible, uh, what an incredible time. So anyway, we, when, when a, a club or an organization donates um, a sizable amount of money to the CCFR, we usually tweet it out and put it on Facebook and put it throughout right. our social media. And uh, I think just the, the donations that have come in recently, I think we should just mention a whole bunch of these organizations that are supporting us. So uh, you've got a list that you want to go through. I will preface it by saying if your organization donated money to the CCFR and we've missed it, just let us know. Um, because yeah. we're juggling um, a lot of different uh, bowling pins here right now, um, and yes. yeah, so it's not it's not that we don't appreciate it. But anyway, why don't you tell everyone uh, give give some of the highlights of the donations we've received lately? Yeah, so there's there's a great list here, and I mean, it's just. In the last couple of weeks, all of this has come in, you know, on top of individuals support. But a uh, big shout out to the Pembroke Outdoor Sports Club. They sent us $5,000, $5,000 as well from the East Elgin Sportsman Association. Both those clubs have donated multiple times, big donations like that. Uh, the Sydenham Club uh, Sportsman Association as well with $2,000. Out of Quebec, we've got the ACA. BC, which in English, the organization's name translates to the Lower Canada Arms Collectors Association. I'm not going to attempt to say it in French because I'll butcher it, but they sent us $5,000 and that's, you know, really meaningful coming out of Quebec. This one is interesting. We got um, a donation from the Springfield Sports Club in New Brunswick. Now, listeners may remember a little while ago, they were embroiled in a court battle with the New Brunswick CFO. Of course, the CFO had tried to overstep their powers as a CFO and attach a whole bunch of conditions to their, their renewal of their club, and they challenged it in court. So not only did they win, which is precedent setting for clubs and, and CFOs all across the country, not just New Brunswick, but they also won a modest uh, monetary judgment, a $2,000 judgment for um you know, for kicking the CFOs butt. And they turned around and sent that to us. So it's pretty meaningful um, because it's it's just an extra special win. Of course, the Wild Sheep Society, 
um, also sent us twenty thousand dollars, which is just holy cow. Yeah, while she's and, while Sheep Society of British Columbia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, British Columbia. That's right. And then we've got the Sherwood Park Fish and Game Association. So they're longtime supporters of the CCFR, and what they do is. For all their members, a portion of their membership fee to the club gets set aside a certain amount, and then they have a variety of choices of organizations that they can donate it to. So it's actually up to the individual member to decide where their donation portion goes to. And the overwhelming majority of members chose the CCFR to donate their uh, donation portion of their membership. So they sent us in a donation for $27,000. Twenty-seven thousand seven hundred ninety dollars. It's so big I can't even say it. So, just crazy support. And then, of course, five thousand uh, dollars donation from the Hamilton Angling and Hunting Association. So, this is all just within the last two weeks. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And I, you know, <clears throat> I just can't tell you how much I appreciate that support and how meaningful it is. And I've mentioned this before too, not just for the for the monetary support. But just that you, that we created an organization where our community trusts us to make best use of their money because people work hard for their money, even even for a, a membership or a $10 donation. Somebody had to go to work for that money. The government yeah. grabs a portion that they think is appropriate and whatever they have left, they choose to, to donate, um, you know, make that donation of the CCFR. And it's incredibly meaningful. So I don't want any that to be lost on anyone ever. So no, um, okay. absolutely. Okay, funny story. Funny story. So, um, because of the big controversy we were involved in, uh, well, not because of that specifically, but uh, things intensified because of this controversy we were embroiled in uh, a couple of weeks ago. I got a lot of a lot of hate mail, right? Me too. And we get yeah, we get hate mail all the time and threats and whatever and and whatever. Like I'm not I'm not worried about any of these people. And in fact when I read this stuff, <clears throat> this this lot this <laughs> there was a there was a really good one where this this woman sent me a couple of emails. And I mean they're like paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs about how, you know, hey, I just heard the good news. You've had cancer twice. That means it's coming back and you'll be you'll be dead soon. And you know, you no one deserves it more than you because you've dedicated your life to instruments of death and just all this crazy stuff, right? And so, mm-hmm. you know, we're like, we Real don't, peach. well, yeah, whatever. I mean, I just read that and I'm like, this is, this is a very, this is a, a very broken person, you know, like yeah. really broken. Right. So to me, and then I'll just, I, you know, I'll read a little bit of it and then I'll just look and I'll go, I'll scroll up on my phone. It's like eight, 10 paragraphs. I'm like, mm, too long. Didn't read. And uh, yeah. so anyway, we get a lot of that stuff. Um, we don't talk about it because. You know, we're not gonna be like, oh, we're getting threats and whatever. It's like, yeah, you know what? It's crazy people send people crazy messages. So anyway, so I was getting a whole bunch of it, and then I get this. I got this email. <laughs> this is great. So this this email came from um, Glenn Peacock, who's the president of the Hamilton Angling and Hunting Association, and it was it was about a five thousand dollar donation. So really, really appreciate that. But what happened is, you always look for like the you know, the person, I think it was like uh, Suzanne Meadows or something like that, you know, that sent me this cancer one, right? And right. Uh, and so you're always looking for common sounding names and that's usually the, the, the bad stuff. So Glenn sends me this email and it says, ha ha donation. And I'm like, oh, nice. Okay, what's this one about? Like, oh, I'm gonna donate a human head to you because you guys are dealers of death or whatever. <laughs> and I'm, luck- I'm lucky I didn't just look at the, the the the, uh, the, subject? the subject line and just be like oh yeah whatever I get a million of these actually no it's just the Hamilton Angling and Hunting Association <laughs> haha donation ha, ha. <laughs> anyway I thought that was funny it's just uh, anyway we really appreciate the help guys and and uh, I thought that was a funny story all right um, last but not least we will say Merry Christmas and thanks so much to everybody for for uh, for all your support and uh, and yeah and just uh, it's been it's been quite a year and. Looking forward to the uh, to the next year and see what happens then, I guess, right? Well, I mean, you know, we have two options. We can quit or we can keep kicking through those doors. So, yeah, let's do it. Well, uh, lying down and, and just taking it, that's not an option and hasn't no. been for us as a group and, and, as, a, and as, as a group of people, including everyone that supports the CCFR. So we will keep, uh, we'll keep hammering 
these people will keep throwing snowballs in their face, give them a face wash, right? <laughs> Every chance. Oh God, we, I would love to. I know, right? Every chance yeah. that we possibly can uh, for as long as we possibly can. So anyway, Merry Christmas to everyone and, uh, and Happy New Year. All right. Merry Christmas. All right, that's going to do it for episode 133 of the CCFR radio podcast. Really getting up there, right? Uh, I've said it before. I wonder when this is all going to end. Anyway, um, really appreciate everyone sharing the podcast. So a couple of things I want to go over with you before I let you go. First thing is share the podcast. Talk to all of your gun-owning friends. Get them involved. Share some of our social media content. All these videos that we have on YouTube and all the other social media content um, uh, platforms, there's a lot of really great stuff to inform people about what's going on. Too many people find out that they own a banned firearm after it's banned. Like, oh, my 1908 Brazilian Mauser. Like, what happened? And I found out it's banned. Some Bill C-21 went through. You know, or my SKS. I'm like, oh, it's just an SKS. I've had this thing forever. Like, if you have buddies that have those guns, like, tell them. Hey, man, you need to get involved. Unfortunately, you shouldn't have to. Government should just do the right thing. But it doesn't. It's populated with people who don't. They don't even know what the right thing is, okay? These are not normal people, okay? So get these people involved. Tell everybody what's going on. Get them to listen to the podcast. Really important, okay? Because now we're getting results, right? The, the, the narrative is evolving for a reason because we're making a difference. And that's because so many people are standing up together at the same time. That's how it works, okay? So anyway, share the podcast and whatnot. Next thing, Tracy and I talked about uh, some ranges and some organizations uh, sending us large donations, okay? Um, I talked about what a privilege it is for me to work on your behalf. It really is the crowning privilege of my life. And um, if we've forgotten to mention anyone, I'm sure you well know that it was not intentional. Uh, we've been running around with our hair on fire for about three months. Like we always have been running around because there's so many things that need to be done. And so we do them. But in the last three months, it's been ridiculous. So many things have been demanding our attention and we can't do everything. The other thing I forgot to mention that I wanted to mention in the monologue is a lot of people have been reaching out. Like I'm getting so many messages and I just can't respond. And, and everyone's message is important and everyone believes their message is important. So don't think I'm ignoring you. I just only have so many hours in a day where I'm conscious, <laughs> okay? So I just can't get back to everybody. A lot of times I will read a lot of messages and I'll take that information in, but I just can't, I don't have time to sit there and respond to 40 messages. I just don't. So anyway, I don't want you to think I'm ignoring everybody, right? Um, and uh, so last but not least, uh, new episode on January the 12th. What I'd like you guys to do is to forget politics, at least for the next three weeks till the next episode, okay? Nothing's gonna happen in politics between now and January the 30th, actually. But take this three-week three, three week period over the, over the holidays where everything slows down for a little while. Put these people out of your mind. Focus on what's great in your life, which is your family and or your friends, doing things that you love to do. Just be thankful for the things that, that you have to be thankful for and, and just put these people out of your mind. These people... They're not good people, and they are not worthy of wrecking your holiday. They're not worth it, okay? So forget about them. They're out, of, they're out of commission for a month and a half anyway, okay? So enjoy your Christmas. Enjoy your holidays if you don't celebrate Christmas. Enjoy New Year. Have a good time on New Year's. Don't hurt yourself, okay? So happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Thanks so much, everyone, for your support. Take care, and we'll see you next year. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.